Thank you, Mike. Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's new digital startup hub. Uh, we have an exciting uh, founder tonight. We hope you enjoyed opening acts, and we invite you to sign up. Uh, if you sign up online, we'll let you know who the uh, fall speakers will be. We have a great lineup. Uh, the opening acts will be, and we're getting some of these founders to come in and do workshops for entrepreneurs. So sign up. You'll see the stuff on the monitors. But welcome here. We have Brian Spaley, the founder of Bonobos and of Trunk Club. Uh, we're excited to have you here, Brian. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So we have a, 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 great, uh, a great interesting story tonight. I think you really enjoy it. One of the great things about founder stories is each person's story is kind of their own. Uh, really unique. Brian has built a great two great businesses, and um, I think you really enjoy it. But I have to say, this is by far the best dressed founder stories audience we've ever had. <laughs> so I don't know if they're already all Trunk Club customers, but you're oh, off to I a good start. I see some good customers in the audience, <laughs> for sure. So for those who don't know, talk, t tell us for a minute, what does Trunk Club do? OK, so the, the principle is fairly straightforward. Guys hate shopping, but love to look good. So how do you solve that problem for them? And for us, it's basically, hey, can you guys fix my mic so I'm not getting all this feedback? Is that possible? Do I just need to move it? Can you move it up? Uh, anyway, sorry. Yeah, it's just it's hard for me to speak yeah, it's not cogently. Yeah. So um, you know, basically, guys hate shopping. And they want to look good, and they want to have great clothes. They want to have a great wardrobe. And um, we, so here's how the business works. You sign up online, we match you up with a stylist. That stylist reaches out on email, over the phone, just gets in touch with you. Ideally, we have a quick conversation with you and le we learn as much as we possibly can, and we get a trunk headed your way. Average trunk has six to eight items in it. Those are sort of upscale retail. When you're getting a sense of it, like, what does that mean? Like, what, what, what kind of things so do you let, want to know let, about? Let, let, let's role play the conversation. Sure. Hey, Pat, I heard you sign up for Trunk Club. I'm your stylist. Would love to sort of figure out what you need. Um, you know, I hear that you're an entrepreneur, so I'm guessing you probably need, you know, like comfortable button-up shirts and jeans to wear to work and maybe a blazer for date night. And you say, hey, you got it, but I actually i am really good on that. What I really need is belts and shoes and Thank something you. else. So we, you know, we listen, we react, we go back and forth. We get a list of stuff that we want to send you. We go through our inventory. We pull the best items that we have for you. And our, our inventory is like, it's basically what you'd find at a high-end boutique or a nice department store. Okay, so like somewhere, Nordstrom, Nordstrom Neiman Marcus, and maybe um, we, we'd like to think our product assortment is far more interesting and compelling than what you'd find at any of the boutiques here locally. We scour the earth for cool brands. We, we definitely don't want you to open your trunk and see a bunch of stuff like Joe's Jeans and Ralph Lauren, which you'd see right. at every department store. Um, that being said, you know, part of this is about discovery. It's about challenging you. And, and, and at, our, at our best, you know, we don't always get it right, right? The, the, Can everybody hear me back? Can you hear me back all right? Yes? Can you hear me back? OK, great. Thank you. Thanks. So at, you know, at our best, we're, we may not get it right in the first try, but we're learning. And for you, so let's say that you live in California and you get your first trunk and you Half of the eight items work really well for you, and you decide to keep three or four of those things. Uh -huh. You send the rest back, and our CRM system, which we, we run on Salesforce, keeps track of all that information. And it's kind of up to you how, when you want to interact with us again. We, you know, we'll follow up. We'll send you a note. Hey, thanks for trying the service. How are things working out? But it's, it's up to you if you want another trunk right away or if you want to wait three months. Guys, some, everyone's different, right? Some guys right. want to work with us literally once a week. Other guys try to basically live at our, at our store here in Chicago. And, and other guys we hear from once a year, and they're still great clients. So what, what we need to do is make sure every single aspect of the way we serve you and your wardrobe is better and more compelling than what's out there right now. So one of the things I've heard from people, um, Truth in Advertising, we're, uh, um, his COO is on one of my boards. So I, I've heard the Trunk Club. And one of the interesting things to me you guys do is with data. Because, you know, you always laugh. You go to buy clothes and, you know, um, I, my wife and I were in New York and went to a store and I was like a triple XL. I'm not a triple XL in anything, but the sizes are all so randomly different. Yeah. I understand you guys do some interesting things to try and actually make us people, people like me know what we'd wear no matter what the brand and what their sizing philosophy is. Yeah, so as we've, as we've grown in size and been able to add a pretty... Um, a pretty awesome engineering team, we started to build uh, systems that kind of basically make the job easier for our stylists. And one of those is on our iPhone app, our internal iPhone app, we have um, a product that the tech team built that will tell you what size a guy is in every different brand. Huh. So based on height, weight, things that he's kept before, and other historical data. Um, and, and that was something that was, you know, was a pipe dream when we first launched three and a half years ago. because. 
you know, we were just getting started, but now we've got, you know, a million data points on what's been kept and what's been returned, and we, we keep all that data and we analyze it. And over time, you know, we're not Amazon, and we probably never will be, but the, there's a lot of really talented engineers who can build algorithms and who can help you figure out sort of, you know, what's working well in, in different parts of the country for different types of guys, different. So a lot of data. Analysis yeah, it's big. It, we will ultimately be a big data technology company, a, a part of what we do. At the same time, we don't think you can build Pandora for fashion, right? You can't tell guys, um, you know, if you like Bach, you'll like Bonobos, right? It just doesn't work that way. Music is one size fits all, and it's 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 just a totally different program. And so, at our best, we think we will make everything but that. Who are you? What do you need? What do you like? What's your story? part automated and then focus the time of our stylists, which is very valuable because they're super talented and they're really busy and they serve hundreds of customers, just basically put everything at their fingertips about you. So maybe we haven't heard from you in six months, but you took three trunks back in 2011 and then another trunk How in, much did Christmas. what I ordered inform what you send me the next time? A lot. A lot. But it's also, that's blended with, you might say, hey, by the way, I also lost 20 pounds and um, I'm losing my hair. And so I need to be more sophisticated. Or I just took a new You're job. You're not saying anything. <laughs> no, I'm actually thinking about myself. Uh, I'm gaining 20 pounds and losing my hair, which is awesome. But I, I, I blame our bar for that um, beer gut that I've developed. Those, so, just so those of you, any, who has been to their uh, headquarters office? So if you haven't, it's pretty cool. Those of you who've been, um, it's very hard to leave because they have a bar and all these, and everybody is super friendly, but they, uh, it's a really cool experience for this hybrid kind of deal. It's, it's really pretty fun. But I can imagine to give you a beer gut because you have great beer and one of the nicest bars in Chicago. Yeah, well, it's certainly not the nicest bar in Chicago, but it might be one of the nicer bars at Chicago area startups that are venture backed. <laughs> How's that for, for qualifying sure. an answer? So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very proud of what we've done in our office. And just a disclaimer, you know, people think, oh, you know, you have this bar, you know, you have all these beautiful women serving guys. Like, what, what's this thing really about? It's not really about drinking. But if you sit a guy down and you say, you're gonna get new clothes, and for the first five minutes, he just sits on a comfortable leather couch and kind of gets to see what's going on on the floor in this cool startup, and has a beer or a scotch or a glass of wine or a bottle of water or a cappuccino or whatever it is that we're serving that day in his hand, it's a really different experience than like trying to find the men's department at Nordstrom and smelling like nail polish remover and dodging you know, strange looking people in a makeup counter that are like spraying stuff at you in the first floor of a mall, right? Like, that sucks. Trunk Club does not suck. And we ask ourselves, but it's, right? But it's, but it's big. I think what you're saying is really big because when my wife and I go someplace, I shop once a year. Yeah. And we'll come in and she'll tell the guy, you have 30 minutes before he's basically going to shut down. Yeah. And if you gave me a beer, you might get 45 on him. You gave me two, who knows? Yeah. And, you, you know, the, the quality of the stylist at Trunk Club is, you know, it's light years beyond the itinerant, you know, I'm, in for, I'm here for a year because I need a job, you know, retail employee on Michigan Avenue. And, right. and I appreciate um, how hard those folks work and that they're just trying to make a living. And usually they're putting themselves through school or working toward a greater objective. Our stylists, I think, are coming to Trunk Club for a career. Mm -hmm. And what, one of the reasons that we've retained so many of them, you know, it's basically a sales force and we've had next sure. to zero attrition is because it, it is one of the few things you can do where you work in apparel, yet you work at a startup, you get to touch fashion, you get to help mm -hmm. people, and you get to be part of a, a growth company. And I think that that's a, you know. They seem to have a lot of fun. I mean, from the times I've been to visit you guys, they seem to, people have a lot of fun working there, it seems like. I think they have fun. I mean, they work really hard. The yeah. bar is high. But one, one of the things that I, you know, I would say, I'm sure there's some founders out here in the audience, you have to think about what opportunity are you providing to the people you hire. You have to put yourself in their shoes and say, if I had that job, would I love going to work every day? And I, I wrote a blog uh, post. I'm an influencer on LinkedIn, which is, I think, dubious. I think I probably have like eight people that follow me in Alaska or something like that, and I probably paid for all of those. But I, I wrote an article today, because uh, I was flying back from Texas, about the similarities between working at, at uh, a startup and playing ice hockey. And one of, the, one of the comments I made was, you know, our company feels a little bit like a locker room. It's like people are hanging out, having fun. I've been fun. in a lot of locker rooms. There's nobody who looks like, in many locker rooms I've been, look like your style. Yes. But it's, it, the idea is like when, when I go to, when I come, <clears throat> so I play at Johnny's and a couple of teams, and, uh, and we're all meatheads. But when we show up at, at hockey, it's like the stress melts away. You feel good. Usually you might be drinking, and 
you're just hanging out with people you like and you're work but you're working hard on something that you care about. Right. And I Absolutely. you know, I compare that to the locker room at Equinox. I, I I'm sort of a health nut, so I spend a lot of time in these different gyms. At the Equinox locker room, it's a little spooky. It's like nobody knows each other. Nobody really knows who's looking at what, and you don't really, you don't like pull your towel off and snap this is somebody. Be interesting. You, you're just like, I gotta get out of here, right? Yeah, like, right. so you're working out at Equinox because you're trying to lose weight, or you've got it, you've got it in your head that you got, you know, you, you it's like working at a law firm or right. something else that's just miserable. And truck club <laughs> is not that way. Like, right. so I ask myself, like, when people come in and sit down. Are they having fun? And you know what? We don't always get that right. There's days where it's grueling. There's I, I got in the elevator last time I was there with um, one of your uh, employees, and she and I were uh, going down. You have a really slow elevator, as I remember. Super slow at and our so own we're, space. It's a nice conversation, long elevator conversation. She was nice, really super nice person. But I asked, she didn't know I knew you, she didn't know I knew Rob, and so she just thought I was a customer. I said, so what's it like there? And she talked about how much she enjoyed it and you know how interesting it was, how innovative it was, and it was, um, you know, if everybody could have a random employee going down an elevator with someone uh, who felt that way, I think, you know, you, you got to feel proud of that. Yeah, we're, we're super fortunate to have that. And I, I think, you know, we're, we're not financially all that successful yet, and we're certainly not, um, you know, we're not Instagram. But we have a lot of fun, and we think a lot about are we creating I, jobs. I think you're, that, you're pretty successful. You know, what can you we, tell us, what can you tell this crowd tonight that would be appropriate, because it's not private, sure. about, about your success? Because I'm, I'm really, you know, I look at where, when I first met you, and now, I mean, it's incredible what growth you've had. Well, uh, credit goes to our, t we have an amazing team, and we, uh, so in 2010, when we launched the business here in Chicago, we did just, just about a million dollars in, a little over a million in revenue. In 2011, we did just over five. Last year, around 17. This year. I think we have a fighting chance at 50, and that's net revenue. And um, we've grown from two employees, myself and my best friend, John Tucker. We were both living in New York. I sort of defenestrated myself from Bonobos because I was failing as a manager there. We'll, we'll get into, we'll get get into, into that. Bonobos, yeah, for sure. and, uh, and had to find another job, and uh, decided to move to Chicago to launch this business and uh, convince my best friend, John, to come with me. And so the two of us rented a 7,000 square foot space on Superior and Orleans, and uh, people came over and like, what are you, what are you doing with 7,700 square feet? I'm like, well, you know, it's like thir about 3,000 square feet per employee is the rule, right? <laughs> and uh, I, sure. have, I have 60 employees, 7,700 square feet. Yeah, well, we had over 100 when we moved to our new space uh, in 7,700 square feet, and it wow. was a total, it was a total sweatshop. In fact, I was accused by our landlord of running a sweatshop, and then <laughs> I, in the apparel business. And then so. I, accu I accused him of, of um, being a slumlord, and you know. You, <laughs> You can imagine how long we've stayed friends. So, um, so look, look, I mean, we, we're really proud of what we've done. It's been a little hard living in the shadow of Groupon and their success. And I think our values and their values as a management team, as, you know, in terms of how many people on our team have sizable chunks of equity and in terms of what we're thinking about trying to build, um, you know, they've, they've been such a success story and such a, such a uh, you know, amazing growth story. It's been a little bit frustrating to have to sit in their shadow four blocks away on, you know, on Chicago. But then we Especially look at... Especially as a consumer um, brand, because, you know, those guys had huge success in the B2B world. Media Bank sold the yeah. and half dollar merger. They're marvelously you know, successful entrepreneurs. They've had, they've had great success, but nobody heard of them until it was a consumer brand. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, good for them. Outside and, of Chicago. Good for them and good for Chicago. We're, we're, we're deeply proud of our brethren here in the space. But I think for us, you know, if we think about, okay... You know, one five seventeen fifty. What's next? You know, we look at businesses like we look at the Sears Tower. It's now the Willis Tower, right? It's named after an insurance company. There's a beautiful condo building at Superior between Superior and Chicago and Orleans and Franklin. Call I don't know what it's called. I think it's can't remember what it's called, but it's a really nice. It used to be Montgomery Ward's headquarters. Right. Montgomery Ward went BK in the seventies. Sears is, as far as we can tell also really struggling. Okay. Marshall Field was bought by Macy's and, and we, we, um, we love to compete with Macy's and we don't think they offer a great service. So where is the next great Chicago outfitter? And you know, I think success for, great history here. success for our team looks like, who cares how big we are or what kind of, if we go public or anything else, let's, let's be known as the place where you come for great clothes. Let's be the world's outfitter out of Chicago and let's rekindle some of the pride that this city has had for the last century as like a place where people can get open, warm, you know, Midwestern values and solve problems for you, you know? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that that's what we're striving to build. 
And we got a long way to go, and that's why I think we're, we're humble about what we've done so far, because our goal is to be, you know, 20 to 50 times our current size. And, um, you know, we also ask ourselves, how many, Nordstrom's largest store is a, a, a half a mile due south on Michigan Avenue. Is that their biggest store? That's their right largest there? store in the country, as far as we know. And their, <clears throat> Nordstrom's men's business is larger than Barney's, plus Saks, plus Neiman Marcus, plus Bergdorf. Wow. So Nordstrom is the gorilla in our space. And I, we really want to just punch them in the nuts here in Chicago. <laughs> we want them to feel, and they're great guys, and they're super successful, and they're much smarter than we are, and they're much more successful. But like, we want guys to no longer turn right when they're coming home from the loop, right? We want them to turn left and come to Trunk Club. And we, we really want, we want to hurt them. We want them to so, feel like, holy cow, Trunk Club's going to do 100 million in Chicago next year. Like, that's actually coming out of our back pocket. Like, that's what we want to be. So I just want to say, for those of you who aren't entrepreneurs and are just getting to know entrepreneurs, this is what you love about entrepreneurs, which is they're absolutely, you know, the passion and, and the belief, and it's, it's awesome. And that's, that, that's what, but that's what made Chicago great. But, you know, that's, that's, that's where our great history comes But we have a great history of that. You know, and when I chose, I was living in Manhattan, and when I chose to put this business in Chicago, I just wanted to live here and be part of this entrepreneurial community. And you know what? There's a lot of really great businesses getting built here right now. I happen to be on the board of Shift Gig, so I was delighted to see that they're part of the program tonight. I'm a huge fan of Eddie and Jeff and Sean. I think they're building something super valuable that the market really needs. They're serving people. And, uh, and you know, it's really early here. It's exciting to be part of that. And we're just a really small part of that. Groupon, others, you know, Braintree, those guys are really big parts of it. But it's fun, it's fun to be here. You know, I, I went to school in, um, in Silicon Valley. I went to Stanford for business school, 05 to 07. And, um, you know, nobody gives Chicago any respect there. And so it's been cool to come back here and say, you know what, forget about San Francisco. So talk, about, talk about why you made this decision, because you're in New York, you go to school, and we'll get to, I want to get to Bonobos in a minute, but, um, you know, you, you, you were running a business in New York, mm -hmm. you were out in New York, you had uh, gone to grad school and, and started your first business out in the Bay Area, but you were con convinced to come to Chicago yeah. to do it. Why? So I would visited Chicago maybe once or twice a year for most of my adult life, like in my 20s. And every time I came, I just, I, I flew in and I, I was so excited to be here. And I flew out and I thought maybe one day I'll be able to live here. And I just, I didn't find, I couldn't find a job here. You know, I, I interviewed with a few firms over the years and it just, it didn't pan out for me to get, um, to get something in town. But what I recognized was, you know, living in San Francisco and then in the, in, then in Palo Alto, there's just like the Bay Area is, it's like the least cool place on earth. And it used to be cool. It's not cool anymore. It's all tech. It's like, there's way too many dudes. There's way too many A4s and S3s and BMWs and German automobiles and like California educated engineers. And it's just not cool, it's not interesting. There's like, there's more sex in a monastery than there is at Stanford. <laughs> and every time I came to Chicago, true story, true story, <laughs> true story. We learned a lot about 90, 2005 to 2007. Uh, well, look, I mean, maybe it was just me striking out time after time, but I, I really felt like, I really felt like, you know, and I'm serious, like there's just, there was no, there was no solid, like social, fashion, other types of intercourse in that part of the world. It's just all tech. And it was, and it was really dorky. Like anybody who's walked down University Avenue in Palo Alto, like there's just, there's no elegance, there's no sophistication. There's just a lot of like people that don't even care about how they look. And it is utilitarian. It, no sure, sure. And I, and I just, I didn't want to build a business where we're trying to, be sophisticated in that part of the world. Now, look, awesome startups out there, awesome investors, awesome technology, awesome software, awesome hardware, but that doesn't make a good party and a good life. That makes like that makes money. And so I, talk about New York then. So New York was awesome because fashion is big in New York. But but yeah, fashion's huge in New York. The problem with New York is I knew that our team. So our stylists have a base salary of, you know, let's call it right around 35, 40k, and then a good one will double or triple that in commissions. So they make. You know, good ones make eighty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and those that are starting out and building their career, maybe in their first year, might do forty to seventy. In New York, if you make that much money, you live like in a lofted, like twin bed in a tenement in Brooklyn, and you can't afford anything. You're marginalized as a human being. And when I ran Bonobos in New York, we had all these people that worked for us, and they were literally like they would eat cereal for dinner. 
Nick, my team here that's in pick, pack, and ship goes to nice restaurants. My team eats at much fancier restaurants than I do. I don't know exactly how that works, but... No, but the, the, the New York thing is big because... It's, you can't I had a roommate from co- or a housemate from college who we went to visit him. He's moving out of his place. He got married. It was an 800 square foot apartment that was selling for a million two. He's like, my landlord's selling the apartment. Yeah. You thought 800 square feet for a million two? Like, how do you live? So I think it's not a great place to build a startup for those reasons. I also, I also found that um, it was really, it was really fun for us to be doing something fashion oriented outside of the fashion center. I think it's allowed us to kind of keep our heads down. And then the, the other thing I love about Chicago is there's just, there's like 8 million people here, extremely well educated. We are the, Probably the largest, I think we're the largest concentration of Fortune 500 companies. So if you want to leave Allstate and work at something small and cool and different, you know, you've got some options, but not nearly as many as you would in the Bay Area. So in a way, it was just talent arbitrage, right? I would go out to bars in River North and Randolph Street. There was this awesome club called Reserve. I think it was open for like a total of five months, and I went there three times. And like, then they got shut down for fraud. Like, you know, very Chicago, like, seedy underbelly, like, you know, guys ended up in jail. But like, I would go to places like that, and I would think, this is where I want, these are the people I want to hire to work for my company. And I don't think that we're going to, I mean, we're, we're looking at Texas for our next office because we actually think it's another great place to do business. Where will you go? Houston. Interesting. I was there this morning. More than Austin. Much more than Austin. Yeah. Austin's got the same problem the Bay Area has. Yeah. It's, it's not cool enough. It's, it's too small. And everybody's a hipster. And hipsters don't make money. They can't buy clothes, right? So that's a problem. <laughs> True story. True story. Sorry, hipsters. <laughs> All right, so let's step back for a second. You referred to uh, what you've done here. And I, I think it'd be, it'd be great to sort of go back to when you were at Stanford because um, you're a, uh, you've been a successful entrepreneur now twice in a fairly short period of time. Um, your first company, Bonobos. Um, why don't you just tell people what Bonobos does real quick and let's go to the begin, rewind at the beginning of that. Sure, story. so Bonobos, I mean, we're, we're now basically a men's e-commerce brand. We look more and more like a men's only J. Crew every day, but we have things that are more personalized and hopefully a little bit more um, let's just say, uh, unique, different, edgy, cool. Um, and, and it started out, it was basically, I couldn't find pants that fit, so I started sewing my own trousers. And that- and so, so she got to back up for a second, because I've never sewn my own shoes. So back, back up, just tell us. So you're, so you're in, what, you're in business school? or? So I started sewing pants when I was in private equity in Boston. And okay. I couldn't find pants that fit very well. Being a hockey player, I kind of have that like big butt, big thigh problem, and then you know try to stay in shape so narrow or waist. And I'm sure there's plenty of other guys who have this issue. Stuff couldn't really, it, you know, you had a lot of extra fabric in the seat, or you know your shirts were all billowy and baggy. It's gotten better, but in 2003, when I started, you know, my little amateur tailor show, um, there was not a lot of good stuff. So, so out talk there. talk about that because I think that's a really interesting. We talk about founder market fit. Yeah. You know, a lot of guys would fit. say, okay, you can't. I can't wear Levi's, so I got to go find a brand that's just baggier. You decided, I want to look good. I'm going to do it myself. So, like, tell us about... Well, truth be told, it's embarrassing. I was too cheap (gasps) to get my pants altered. I I was complaining to my girlfriend about how it cost me 50 bucks to have, like, a simple alteration done on the seat of my pants. And one day, in addition to bringing over dinner, we live, like, two blocks apart on Beacon Hill in Boston. She brought over her sewing machine, and she's like, hey, ha-ha, maybe you should start sewing your own pants. And so I kept the sewing machine, and, and now, you know, we, we still stay in touch. And I'm like, hey, ha-ha, like, I now sell a lot of pants. Like, it's pretty fun. Um, like, 10,000 pairs a day at Bonobos. Um, and, and uh, I, you know, it was funny. I was working in finance, and I just did not find myself satisfied or having a creative outlet at all. Cool job. I really enjoyed it. I actually worked with great people, learned a ton. I was, like, the junior guy. So building models meeting companies. I re- actually was very fortunate to have the role. It just wasn't solving that, like, how do you exercise some of your creative... So, I gotta know, how many pairs of pants did you make? Well, so from scratch, yeah. zero. I mean, it's very hard to make. You gotta have a special machine to, machine to do pockets. What I would do is I would go and buy size 34 pants. I'm a 32, but 34 gave me enough space in the thigh. I'd turn them inside out, take apart the seams, and then put them back together. So, I'm not capable of, like, you hand so me a bowl of How many pairs of pants cloth. you do that with? Oh, I did it with every pair of dress pants I owned. So like eight or eight or nine pairs. Wow. And and then. And how was your how was your hemming? Did it look good? It looks it looked how do you okay. Learn that? So I yeah, my girlfriend went to fashion school, so she taught me how to do the whole like how to turn it on and turn it off. It's not that hard. It's like running a power saw. You know, it, 
It's it's a little intimidating, but then you just like push the wood through and it gets I don't cut. Have to wear the wood though. I mean, my yeah. wood's a little crooked. I'm alright. So right. so um, no, but I I just started. It's not that hard, and and then I got excited about it, and so I started buying every pair of pants I could find that fit well in some way, and then I took all of those, lined them up, and created a pattern, which is basically like um, all the different measurements that get cut up. Um, it, it looks kind of like a, a blueprint for a house, and um, <laughs> and when I got to business school. I finally got sort of the, so you basically, the gumption. you basically broke down, reverse engineered how pants should be built. That's right. And they're not, huh. it's not, I mean, men have been doing this. Tailors, men and women have what been made you think making clothes. What made you for, decide to take it that far? Um, I just, you know, I would come home from work at like 8 o'clock and I had to do a project. I had to have something going on or else I would just, I, I don't know, I just wanted to, I wanted to work on something. Before that, I had a, ha a habit of, um, of refinishing furniture in my garage in the mm -hmm. Bay Area. And I would just go to buy stuff and then sand it and paint it and then put it in my room. Again, because I was frugal, but also just because I, I kind of enjoyed having stuff to do. And at that point, I was like, maybe I should become a general contractor, but that just didn't feel like the right next, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the right connections. And so the pants thing was really, I'm just gonna solve this for myself. And then when I got to business school, in, you know, a couple years later, everybody at Stanford seems to have some great idea. And I was, I was kind of lacking um, like any sort of, I, I wasn't, I'm not a very talented, I, I don't know how to um, develop, I don't know how to write code. I don't know how to do it, which by the way, like, makes me feel like a dinosaur now. If I feel like if there's one thing I could do, if I weren't so busy in my current role, it would be like, I gotta teach myself how to code. I gotta go to Code Academy or. Um, well, you want an amazing fact, so um, I'm on the North, uh, Trustee Northwestern and we, our Entrepreneurship and Innovation Committee, which Peter Barris, and uh, chairs, we went sure. out. So we went to Harvard and Stanford for benchmarking for Northwestern. And, Amazing fact, 50%, I think I've said this before, 50% of Harvard seniors, 50% take intro CS of all. 90% of all Stanford seniors have taken intro CS. 50% of English majors have taken intro CS, and part of it is because they made intro CS like the guys here at uh, Code Academy to make it really very practical, yeah. but it's a huge, totally. I mean, what you and I would have experienced as a foreign language is now the way people sure. think about, I wanna learn this language. That's cool, I mean, if I were a chancellor at a Big Ten school, I would basically say, 30% of our graduates need to be CS majors, period. I mean, I, that's how you solve this problem, right? I mean, it's so easy, like, create more people in this part of the world who know how to write code. We're currently hiring for a senior product engineer, for a, um, a, a UI developer, and for um, a senior product manager, and maybe one other thing that I'm forgetting. Like, if you wanna work at Trunk Club, your best bet, your highest odds are if you're, a great, if you're great at writing code, and if you're talented, if you've been a product manager, if you can speak that language. It's like, that's the future, right? All these companies, and by the way, I have a bunch of friends that are also entrepreneurs in different cities, every single city, not, not just Chicago, not just New York, not just San Francisco. Every single city needs more Ruby on Rails developers and more engineers. Every single startup will always have an open spec on their website for more engineers. No question. And so it's like if you want, that's the way of the future. And, and so getting back to where we, we got so to take here. Us, take us back to Stanford. So you're at Stanford. Yeah. Everybody else has code and all these interesting ideas. Yeah, and I, you know, I was living in Texas before I went there. I was living in Austin and I was working at a healthcare company and um, doing like house calls. It was a home nursing business and I was um, sort of riding along and, and helping with um, mergers and acquisitions and just kind of young guy on the management team doing whatever they asked me to do. And so I showed up having very little, you know, recent exposure to what was happening in the Valley. And everybody I talked to just had like some cool thing they were working on and I thought, what do I have that no one else here has? And it's this interest in trousers. I have this pant blue, blue, blueprint. I have the blueprint. You've cracked the genome to pants. So I'll never forget. In my first, in, in the spring of my first year at the GSB, which is what we call Stanford's, so forgive me, my spring of the first year in business school, my third, third uh, quarter, I put together the dream team of guys to do a research project on pants. And one of my classmates had worked at McKinsey for two years and then Levi's in Bottoms Strategy, which is a sweet title. <laughs> um, and Bottoms. and th another guy had, um, was one of the founders and leaders of Nike ID. Cool. And the third guy had done a bunch of retail cases for BCG. And I was just passionate about this and had, you know, I was the tinkerer and kind of a, you know, the go get him guy. So 
we got the project approved, which meant we were going to get uh, two credits for just working on this all quarter. And if we had a good, uh, if we had a good like final project, the professor would say like, stamp two credits, which is cool, right? You know, it's like Stanford letting you kind of chart your own course a little bit. Unfortunately, the day before the quarter started, uh, I found out that one of the team members was basically cheating on. Well, my girlfriend was cheating on me with him. So our team got knocked down to three from four. And uh, we still put his name on the paper as a gentlemanly thing to do, and he got his two credits. But we lost our, our Nike ID guy. And uh, the other three of us spent the whole quarter working on, yeah, that was embarrassing. Yeah, I'm like, oh, pants project. And I'm cuckolded. Awesome. So um, uh, Stanford was humbling in a lot of ways for me, because I, I didn't have a lot of the skills that a lot of the other people had. And, uh, and it gets worse, because I failed you know, in my first startup, too. But um, I, we, what we spent our time on was, does the market need this product? So we didn't write a business plan. We didn't build a model. We didn't, we didn't do any of that stuff. We just talked to guys. We went into their closets. We said, show us the pants that you have. Tell us about how you interact with them. Which ones do you wear? Do you like any of the ones that you have? Like, where do you shop for them? We did, it, basically, we were copying IDEO's methodology, their sort of in-depth consulting design methodology. And my best friend, John Tucker, at the time, who now is like a co-founder at Trunk Club, had, was working at IDEO. So I basically, oh, cool. he gave me a lot of advice on how to do this, and, we, and this is all we did. And then we wrote this report that was like, there is a massive need for better fitting men's pants. And we've talked to guys about it, and we ran a 250 person survey, mostly of like MBA types who were in our target market. And then we did these, we did 17, you know, hour long with pictures and detailed notes interviews. And that was the project. And the marketing guy was like, this is cool. This is great. You guys should start this company. So he left the room. We got, we got the stamp. And I looked at the other two guys. And I said, so how are we going to split up the equity? Because this thing is going to be a big company. And they looked at me. And they were like, I have no desire to pursue this at all. I was just doing it to get credit. <laughs> and, but they were cool dudes. And they're still, to this day, friends. In fact, one is the founder of Wheels, which was just sold to um, Relay Rides, Jeff Miller. Before that, he worked at um, Better Place and got out of there when it was good to get out. The other fellow, Jeff Hurst, is a partner at McKinsey. Actually, was going to be a partner at McKinsey and left, and he's some senior guy at HomeAway in Austin or Airbnb. Whatever, whichever one of those is in Austin, he works oh, there. So these guys are doing fine, but they didn't want you know. And so there was this lesson for me: was like, oh man, it actually takes an enormous quantity of initiative to actually go from okay, we did this project to now I'm actually going to produce a product. But that really gave me confidence that it could work. And so acting as, you know, just acting sort of independently in my second year, I went through the process of buying fabric, getting that pattern graded into different sizes. You know, so the pattern was a size 32, was the sample size. I had to make 34, 36, 38, work on the length, get samples made. And I did all so, that on my so, own. So, so wait a second, back up. Because this, like, this, you're not a coder, so you're not doing code. You're, no. you're, you're building pants. So. I speak the language of fabric and trousers and all that. I, right. I, that so it's but, an interesting, but, but, but it's kind of like coding. It's, no, it is. It's it all is. logic problems in right, the no, end. You, but, but this is what's interesting is you're, you decide to do this, but then you got to actually make pants. This, you said before, you know, making pants is actually hard. So you're at Stanford. You want to start this business. Everybody else said, you know, thanks for the A, got to go. So you're going to start this business. How does one start? an apparel business in Palo Alto, California? So it's hard. And, you know, um, I, the big stumbling block for me, Pat, was finding fabric. Um, and if I'd lived in New York or LA or known then what I know now, it would have taken me like a couple of weeks. Instead, it took me nine months. And um, I'll never forget, um, there's a business called uh, Quarter Rounds, which is like this horizontal corduroy company. And actually, they've done quite well. And it's now called Beta Brand. It get turned into beta brand. And the founder is this fellow, Chris Lindland, who was the only person I could find who'd manufactured pants in his career. And I basically wrote him a love letter and, um, and tried to work for him. And I was basically like, I will work for you after business school if you would just hire me. And he's like, ah, you know, I, I don't need MBA types like you. Um, and so, but he was nice enough to give me a little bit of advice. And, uh, and that was sort of like, you, you might buy fabric here or whatever. And then one day, I was actually going to go um, up to Tahoe because we had a, a share house, you know, people pile in. That's like a big Stanford thing to do. It's a ski house in the winter. And I was going to drive up there, and it was like March. And I was going to get, I was like 7 a.m. I'm in the driveway. I'll never forget this moment. This was like the seminal moment. I'm sharing a house with five other students in Atherton, California. 
and I'm putting my skis in the car. And I have this moment, it's like 7.05 in the morning. I'll never forget, it was like March 7th. I won't forget this day ever. It was a Friday morning. I don't have class on Mondays, Wednesdays, or Fridays at Stanford, right? It's like- Very yeah, entrepreneurial thing. Yeah, very do. entrepreneurial to not have any class. And, um, <laughs> and, I, and I'm, I'm like, you know what? If I don't go buy fabric today, I'm never gonna make this happen. And so I took the skis out of the car, I went up to my room, I Googled Design District Los Angeles, having never spent a minute in any design district anywhere in the country, and, uh, and found the, the intersection 9th and Maple. I got in my car, I drove for six hours, I parked at 9th and Maple, I had $2,000 in cash in my pocket, and I bought like 41 yards of dark green like canvas twill that I could make uh, like my first run of trousers out of. And then I discovered this fabric store called Michael Levine, and it's this awesome, it's more of like a quilting store than like a, it's like a Minnesota fabrics, but in LA. Um, and I, I discovered all these magnificent patterned fabrics. And I thought, I can't make pants out of those, but maybe I can use them somehow in my product. Cause that's what I'm really drawn to as, a, as like a, the, the, the gayest straight man in the world, right? Like I, all I can think about is like how awesome these colors and like they're pinks and purples and flowers. And I'm like, if only I were a woman, I could just like wear all this stuff or if whatever. And so I was like, well, I gotta put them, I gotta put them on the inside of the products. And I'm actually wearing bonobos today. They got polka dots in the pocket. And that was how I came up with the idea for lining the waistband and the pockets with colorful fabrics that match the self. So after buying that roll of green cargo. Colorful fabrics that match the self, sorry. So um, in, a, in the parlance of the trouser world, the uh, fabric that is shown on the outside is usually referred to as the self or on, like on a jacket. And then the, the inside is called the liner. And so the self fabric, I bought all that green. Uh, I thought green would be a cool color instead of khakis. And then I discovered all these cool corduroys that had stretch in them, which was another big bailiwick for me because I got you know this big butt and stretch really helps if you gain weight, lose weight, all that stuff. So I, I paired these corduroy fabrics with these colorful prints. And then I went to a factory with my pattern and I said, please make me samples. And they said, you're crazy. You don't have any idea what you're doing. I said, here's my pattern. Here's my fabrics. Please make me samples. And they said, well, we'll charge you $250 for each sample, which is a lot. I, I never paid that much subsequently. And I said, okay, here's $1,500. Can you have them ready next week in cash? And they said, oh, no, 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 don't give us your cash. We don't, we don't, you know, we don't, we, that's not how it works here. And I was like, that's how I do business. Here's $1,500, please make my trousers. And they're like, all right, you're, you're for real. And I said, I will be here next week when they're ready. You call me, I'll show up. I, sh I would always show up 15 minutes early. The garment district is, in like the, the whole fashion world is filled with flaky people who have these ideas and don't follow up. And very few in, you know, former you know, private equity guys who walk around with cash and show up on time and pay and say, this is what I need, this is what I do. So I picked up those first five pairs of pants. I took them around to friends on campus. They were like, these are cool, I'd buy a pair. I went right back up to San Francisco and I made 20 more pairs. And I proceeded to ping pong back and forth between LA and the gar there's, a, there's like a very small garment district in the Bay Area that actually, I use a cut and sew shop across the street from where the Giants play in Soma. And, uh, and I went back and forth and I made 20 pairs and then sold them, I made 80 pairs and then I sold them and I made 100 pairs and I sold them. I was just selling them to classmates and out of the trunk of my car. And I hadn't really spent any money on anything other than products and I had real revenue coming in. And that was, that was for me the sort of, that was when I really learned sort of the, the, the poetry of product market fit. It's like, make something without spending that much money, make it yourself, learn how to do it, be authentic, and get it out in the market and sell it yourself. Number one problem I see the companies I angel invest in when they fail, and most of them do because I'm a terrible investor, is they're not good enough at sales, right? They, they, don't, they don't actually, like, they're not willing to go out and sell the dickens out of whatever it is they're making. So that's how Bonobos got started. So, so talk for a minute about, um, on Bonobos, some of the things you learned early on in product market fit. Like what, was the, what were some of the early lessons learned? Number one lesson. Of those five samples, four were brown corduroys with the same liner. The fifth pair was turquoise. And I was thinking like, all right, I'm paying 250 bucks for these samples. I might as well make, and they're all gonna fit me because I'm the fit model and I'm a 32 and like blah, blah, blah. Patterns made to fit me. I might as well make That's something. That's your fallback plan. If not, I just got a wardrobe. Exactly. Well, it's like, and I was like, why am I spending all this money on brown corduroys when I really only need one pair of brown corduroy? And I already have a bunch of brown. I love brown. I wear a lot of brown. Um, 
So I was like, why don't I make that tur? And I'd seen this turquoise corduroy I love so much, I just bought it. I bought like six yards of it for no good reason. I just couldn't help myself. I'm like, uh, just, you know, uncontrollable in this fabric store. And, um, and I mean, it's dangerous, right? You put like a, a well-financed MBA that's aggressive into a fabric store and it's like, you know, weird well, shit happens. You're like, you're like, you're like a guy shopping when he's hungry, at the grocery store when he's hungry. You're yeah. like, oh my God, I can yeah. buy that. That's exactly right. I could buy that 41 yards of that. That's exactly who I am. I bought a lot of yardage. And uh, so I made the fifth pair in turquoise. And then, uh, of course, I start wearing the turquoise ones because I think they're really fun and what better way to advertise your product to your classmates. And people knew that I'd done this. I was like the pants guy on campus because the, the previous year I'd been bugging them about like, what pants do you like? And right. you know, people had like, I heard can't that. be that many pants. Bailey's the pants guy, that's kind of funny. Like, yeah. you know, people were really supportive there. It's a yeah, cool, it's one, of the, one of the things I think is one of the most redeeming qualities of the Bay Area is the collaboration and, and sort of supportive feeling. You know, it's sort of like a Burning Man thing. You know, it's like people just want to help you express yourself and build things. And I'm, I'm deeply grateful to San Francisco and, and Stanford for that, like what that sort of imbued in me and the confidence it gave me to, to try wacky things. That's cool. But I start wearing these turquoise cords and I'm giving the brown ones to my friends to try on. And lo and behold, several of the guys are like, hey, those brown ones fit well, but what I want is turquoise. And that's when I realized that other people might buy what I thought was sort of a, you know, a fourth or fifth standard deviation desire turned out to be like a, you know, one and a half standard deviation desire. I, my stats is escaping me at the moment, but what I'm trying to say is maybe like 20% of my customers actually wanted those wacky colors. So I went long on those and they ended up so being- you're doing like analytics in your head on the turquoise. Thing. Oh yeah, I mean, I have tons of analytics, I love it. I, it was so fun to actually, we had, a, we had a class at Stanford called Data and Decisions and it was fun to start generating data to make decisions and it was like, really interesting and so what I found, product market fit, I'm talking to all these guys, I'm handing them brown corduroys and they're all like, actually, the turquoise ones are cool too. So I not only made turquoise, but I made sage green, they became the mint juleps, one of our best selling pants of all time. Lined with like a cool diamond fabric that was sort of reminiscent, I'm like, they're like the perfect Vegas pool pant when it's 70 degrees outside or like, they, you know, guys started saying, I gotta get more bonobos, not I gotta get more pants. And that was still when I was just selling them out of the trunk of my car and then, that's when I felt like, okay, I got something. So, I might so, have something. So I wanna go into where you take the company, but. You told me something interesting we were talking the other day about one of your key professors actually taught the class in product market fit. Right. Talk about what you learned there and how that informed what you did as an early stage entrepreneur. Man, you know, I think, I think if there's something I would recall about Bill Barnett and Andy Rockleff's class, it's called product market fit. And it's a half semester or half quarter class, two credit course at Stanford. They still teach it today. Um, and it, students love it, is, is basically, a lot of money gets wasted in startups on products that the market doesn't actually need. And so the sooner you can figure out if people really want to buy what you're selling, there's some awesome entrepreneurs lurking here in 1871. There's like a hundred cool companies just waiting to get built where people are working really hard on stuff. I would, if I had advice for all of them and some of you, it would be do anything you can to get data and feedback from the market on what you're building. The mistake I made, and one of the things I learned about in product market fit that was probably less intuitive was, competition means nothing. In a startup, execution is everything. And so, what can you build, right? What can you go out and, and do, and how can you figure out, if the market likes what you're doing, don't worry about if other people are doing it too. Just get your head down and keep iterating and listen to your customers and go sell whatever it is yourself so that you can be chief salesperson. One of the things we pride ourselves on at Trump Club is like, when we were struggling, the first six months were really tough, every single member of the team took on a sales goal. Kevin Price, my CFO, John Tucker, our you know, head of user experience. These guys are not salespeople, they're highly analytical, they're super talented. They forced themselves to go out and sell to develop empathy and compassion for the sales team we've ultimately hired. Everything we do, at Trunk Club is built around supporting our sales team. And it's because we always think about what does the customer want, how do we learn from them, how do we provide them with a great service. And so product market fit for me is just like, you don't know what your customers are gonna want and buy. The hard part is people always think they do. And I think that's where the discipline of it's so important because yeah. there's a tendency to kind of fall in love with people's, own, you know, fall in love with your own whiteboard idea. 
and that I think that advice to get out there is so important. Well, you got to do both, right? Yeah. You got to you got to have vision if you're a founder. You got to you got to believe in what you're selling, but you also have to be humble about what do people really want from you. You know what? Like, do does anyone really care about the ninth sport sports bar with tons of TVs here in Chicago? Well, it's called Municipal. It's right by our office. From what I can tell. They're really personable, and people like the people that work there, and they have a good experience, so they go back. There's, you know, no doubt there's a ton of competition, but the owner, Sam, is a good entrepreneur. He's a really good entrepreneur, and he's, you know, I don't know how they're doing. I haven't seen their numbers. But I know that, you know, you can open something that's competitive in the middle of, like, a very fierce market, and if you know what you're going to care about and do, well, and in their case, I think it's service and, and maybe food and maybe, you know, maybe sort of maybe being a little further off the tourist path of Michigan Avenue, or just filling this void we have over by where our office is. Like they, you know, they're get, they're putting themselves out there. They're challenging themselves. And I think, so, I think so let's let's go back to um, for a minute to Bonobo. So you, you you got this thing going. It's starting to cook. You got product. You feel like you get product market fit, and you decide to move across the other side of the country. How come? So we had to be in New York because we wanted to produce domestically, and and there's a preponderance of garment shops and uh, fabric sources in Manhattan. And how was that? Exp Talk a little bit about your experience in New York and a little bit about, you know, the Bonobos experience. So it was fantastic. It was intoxicating. We, we were growing quickly. Um, I had a great partner. My, my best friend from business school joined the company shortly after graduation and is really a co-founder and deserves, you know, a ton of the credit for what we've accomplished. He's still the CEO today, Andy Dunn. You know, I never would have done anything in the startup world had it not been for how supportive he's been of me. And he's just a wonderful guy. So Andy and I are living in New York and we're running this business together and sales are growing leaps and bounds and we're getting invited to fun parties and we're meeting cool people and we're doing something creative and I'm walking around the garment district carrying fabric around like on my shoulder like I'm fashioning myself as like Arnold Schwarzenegger in Commando you know he's carrying that log <laughs> around and it's like the beginning of the movie and Alyssa Milano's his daughter and I'm like this is awesome you know like there we get to do really cool stuff like I actually have a creative job for the first time in my life and uh, it was really great but um, I was a terrible manager and leader of that business. I think it was a great founder and designer, but it's just really hard for me to understand how to build a team. And I was th so, hey, talk, talk about the lessons learned. What oh are the man, lessons learned from Bonobo? I made so many mistakes. It was just crazy. I mean, so I was thirty years old and I'd never managed people before. You know, some of my classmates in business school were military veterans. Um, you know, amazing, amazing men and women. You know, selfless, served our country. Most of them did multiple tours in Iraq because of the timing of when our class. Mm -hmm. Uh, matriculated the fall of 2005, and uh, and those those folks had real leadership and management experience. I, I had no idea. I had worked in, you know, at Bain and a private equity firm and at a healthcare company that were filled with primarily homogeneous, like very talented, ambitious type A folks with fancy pedigree, you know, degrees. And at Bonobos, we were hiring all kinds of people to help us build the business. And I just, I really struggled with how to motivate people and how to lead and how to inspire. Um, and yet, you know, as a creator and designer, there's a little bit of like you want to be Steve Jobs, right? You know, Steve Jobs has this reputation, had this reputation for terrifying employees and firing them in the elevator and being a tyrant about making sure that the product got exactly right. And, you know, I didn't fashion myself to be Steve Jobs and never will be, um, but felt a little bit like I need to be really autocratic to protect the brand and to protect what we're about. And I wrote every word on the website and I uh, was the fit model in every, photo every photograph of the product and I named every trouser and did the write-ups. Um, you know, it was a big part of our branding early on. We, you know, I did everything and I was, I was terrible at delegating. You gotta learn how to delegate. I made a lot of decisions I wasn't qualified to make. One of the great rules of thumb I've learned from that process is if you're not capable of making an important decision at your startup, Try to hire someone who is. Give, give an example. I mean, it's, it's a profound thought. But give people an example so that if they experience it, they can recognize it. So we moved into a new office space. And I, I, I fancy myself this very capable, spatial sort of visionary. And uh, we signed a lease. And you know, we, we were sort of bullish about our own ability to pick what was right. And we, grew, we spent a lot of money on things in the space we shouldn't have spent money on, and we grew out of the space in nine months. We probably should have spent more time talking to capable realtors, you know, capable commercial brokers. But we were, we were you know, 30-year-old kids from Stanford who thought we were invincible, and 
They're like, oh, we'll figure this out. We'll rent the space. We'll do all this. It's like, I should have talked to five other startups and said, What's the, what are the three things I'm going to do wrong when I rent my first space? Mm -hmm. And instead, I was like, oh, I, I'm going to find this perfect. I know I want to face north and west. And I'm going to do all this. And then we started to stupidly, like, I, I put money into the wrong stuff. And I made a bunch of mistakes. And you know, my, I have a, a real estate, um, a phenomenal real estate advisor, Jeff Lindenmeyer. Is he here? Yeah, Jeff. So Jeff, I now, you know, I now take every introduction I can possibly get to commercial real estate friends because one, they're all potential customers for Trunk Club, but two, I have something to learn from all of them. But only after I totally screwed up the first two spaces we leased and wasted a lot of money did I develop the humility around, like, you got to actually go and ask questions or hire somebody, in this case, someone like Jeff, who found our magnificent space for us. Um, and get help, right? Don't think that you're going to be able to do everything. So that, I mean, is that, is that a yeah, good example? Great. I think it's fantastic. But, you know, what we try and do here at Founder Stories is give people examples of things that they may encounter themselves and really appreciate because it's different as a founder. Sure. You know, when you do the story five years later, it all seems like it was just a natural path. It looks easy, and yeah. it's not. Oh, it's anything but, you know, and I would say for anybody who's, who's digging deep, eating ramen noodles and just, getting slammed on email and losing customers or not finding customers or trying hard at work building their startup. Like, I've been there and, and my hat is off to you. I, it, to me, that's the fun part of being at a startup. It's not, you know, oh, now you're Brad Keywell and you have like $400 million and everybody and his brother is gonna beg you for something for the rest of your life. Like, my hat is off to Brad. I actually think he's a brilliant guy and super successful, but it's, it's not that easy being Brad now. It was a lot, probably a lot more fun being Brad when he was like a, a Michigan law school graduate starting his, his first business eating pizza at midnight and like a living, little bit nervous. Living in Madison, Wisconsin. I mean, if you listen to Brad and Eric uh, Lovkowski, they'll talk about, you know, the early days and, you know, I, they always say like, you know, that their first company failed. Yeah. They went out there and you look of how hard they were working, what they were doing. And it's, uh, it's easy to sort of make the startup seem like you show up and you're, you, if your idea is good, you'll be successful and it's every, anything but. Yeah, and you know, um, a lot of people fail in their first attempt or their first and second attempt, but it's noble, I think, to try and fail uh, versus to just kind of hang on the sidelines. And I, I, I admire it. I, I'm glad that I got to go through that. And I'm, I'm not embarrassed to tell stories. At Stanford, they wrote a case about bonobos. And if I were to distill the case into sort of three bullet points, uh, Brian is an idiot. Andy and Brian are idiots. Brian made a lot of terrible decisions. And we go back and we, 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 were, we were teaching this course to the, the school, to like the, one of the popular entrepreneurship electives. And people are just like, I can't believe you come back and admit to all the really dumb <laughs> stuff that you did. Because you know, you're supposed to be this like, successful entrepreneur. And like, the whole point of, of being part of a learning process is, is admitting that stuff and being comfortable. Yeah recognizing well, I, do, you know, I, I started blogging recently and, and telling some of the stories because I learned every mistake the hard way yeah you were telling me that that's and, awesome uh, and uh, I put too. it out there and people look they read it and they're like you know um, you're, uh, you're awfully candid about all your mistakes I'm like listen if you don't know why I made it my advice isn't worth anything right like only when you can visualize yourself in that position can you figure out how to do it and I think the hard part I would say I probably didn't have the courage to know it myself, let alone do it, until we had gotten a lot of growth and gotten some rep recognition for growth. Um, but you know, the, you're a better entrepreneur the quicker you are willing to sort of confront that and learn. I use an example now. I would say it's like uh, if you look at the Giants won the Super Bowl two seasons ago. And you look at the, when they won the Super Bowl, it was all they barely got in the playoffs, and it was one of those things they lost four games in the middle of the season, but they got better every week. Right. And I'm like, as an entrepreneur, it's all get about better, every, better week. every week. That's you know, it's not like you show up and you run. It's the also table. all about you know going every other with beer and water. <laughs> I'm right, sure so, other people know that lesson. So let's talk uh, a minute. We'll go to uh, a little bit about Elite Bonobos. Um, what can you tell people about um, the, the decision to leave Bonobos sure. and, and, and and the transition here? This is a funny. It was a funny summer, 2009. So I went to China four times because we were working on. Um, adding capabilities in, in Asia for manufacturing. And um, I spent a lot of time on planes, and I, I kept getting these emails from Andy that felt very dissonant, that were disconnecting. We, just, we, we were just growing apart on what we wanted to build, what our vision was for the company. And you know, bless his heart, Andy's just an incredibly talented communicator and was capable of saying things like, Brian, when you do this, it makes me feel this way. Staying on his side of the net, not being offensive, not attacking, just being a really good communicator. And it came out that 
We just weren't meant to be co-leaders of a business anymore. Perhaps only the two of us could have been co-founders of this business. I'm, I'm deeply proud of the contributions I've made at Bonobos. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of, of all the failures that I made. I, I, I tried my best every day, and I know he did as well. Found you had a vision and found it. Yeah. Got off the ground and launched sure. a fantastic business. Sure. And you know, and, and he gets most of the credit because if a, but he's it's still net, there, it's a net success for everybody. Sure. And in a good learning experience, and better than just spending two more years working at Bain, you know, <laughs> which is what I would have done maybe if I hadn't come up with that. So, um, I think, you know, one day he sent me a long email. Actually, this email is a focus of one of the study questions on the Stanford case, which basically was this incredibly verbose and long email around how he basically thought we should stop working together and one of us should leave and the other one should stay a CEO. And if you were okay with it, I probably would like to stay a CEO. And he sent that email to me in China. And it's like, it's kind of like, it's just a bomb to drop on your friend and your co-founder. And uh, it doesn't seem like an email topic. No, but you know, and it, to Andy's credit, it was tough to talk to me at the time because I have a rapier of wit and I'm very, very strong headed and stubborn. And so like, I think I blame myself for most of, you know, you got to look at your, you know, if someone else doesn't have the courage to talk to you about something, it's at least half your fault. At least that's the way I would approach it in like a, in a relationship of sorts. And, uh, and I take a lot of responsibility for what went wrong. But ultimately, we got to this point, we're sitting in the office on a Saturday. We worked around the clock. I mean, we were just always there. And he looked at me and he said, you know what, I think, I think we need to talk about this now. And I said, yeah, I read your email. I think I got back from China on like Friday afternoon or Friday evening, or maybe even Saturday morning. So, you know, I'm jet lagged. It's 90 degrees outside. It's New York. I'm living on $70,000 a year. And my best friend and co-founder is telling me like, you really suck at what you do and you should probably leave. It's a, it's a tough time for me, a really embarrassing, anxious, difficult time. And ultimately when he said, look, I'm sure that I want you to leave. And if you won't leave, I, I will, because we can't work together. I said, okay, I will leave. And I think that really surprised him. It took a lot of courage on my end to say you that. I'm not trying company. to, yeah, exactly. I founded the company. And I had 400 people I was going to have to call, including my mom, and say, like, hey, I, I defenestrated myself from bonobos because I suck at leading people. And if, the, if we'd been on a lower floor, I literally would have jumped out of a window. Um, not to hurt myself, but if there was like a pool or something, just theatrics <laughs> are important. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, you know, I said, okay, I'll go. And he said, I said, when? And he said, now. Yeah. Like, now. I said, well, we signed up to do this fashion show in Mexico City next week. And it's probably gonna be inappropriate for us to bail on that commitment. He said, call the guys in Mexico City, see if they can fill, fill in for you, or if they'd, if they'd actually want us to drop out. If they say yes, then drop out and you're done. Do you even ever need to come back? If they say no, um, you know, go down and do the show. So they said no, emphatically, we want you down here in Mexico City. So I produced a 22 look runway show, like full fashion show. I mean, yeah, it's Mexico City, not in that Bryant Park in Manhattan, but it was a, it was a very big deal there. And uh, I had no idea what I was doing. And I had to, for the first time, put together 22 looks. And it was incredibly stressful. It was a, definitely the hardest production I did at Bonobos. And I had to do all that knowing that on the Friday I flew home from Mexico City, I would, I would never work at Bonobos again. And, uh, and so it's sort of like living a lie, right? It's like putting on a good face for the kids when you're getting divorced, but they don't know yet or something like that. And it, it was just like, immensely humiliating and frustrating and also empowering because it's sort of like, all right, like I've, I'm leaving the company I founded. I'm not fighting about it. I'm, I'm, I'm taking this, I'm just taking it head on. I'm owning my responsibility for it. And after that, I've, I've felt like somewhat liberated on the ego front. Like I, clearly I have an ego and a healthy one about what we do and I care a lot about it, but I kind of realize, you know, I always joke with my board, um, I'll do it again. You know, like I'll, I'll leave before you guys ever need to get rid of me. I'll know that my number's been called. I've been told by my best friend face to face, you should not work here anymore because you suck at managing. And, uh, and I, I couldn't really rebut the claim. And so, you know, for people, I, I get calls. I got a call from, this is so random. I was in Provence on a cycling trip two weeks ago. I got an email from a founder in Brazil. I said, Brian, um, I, <laughs> I'm in a really tough spot. He happens to be a co-founder of like a $200 million business there that's absolutely killing it. And he said, I, I, know, I know you through this, that, and the other. Um, 
I had no idea who he was. He said, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to talk to me for 10 minutes. I'm thinking about leaving my company. My founder and I are having real problems, and you're the only person I know of in the world that could talk to me about this. Because I think I'm the only person who's just admitted it over and over on TV at Stanford and all these other places. And so the word gets around, like, well, Brian fired himself and sucked at Bonobos, and he'll talk about it. And so here's this guy in Brazil, and I'll never forget him. My girlfriend and I are riding through like the, the fields of, you know, maize and, and, and um, you know, vintners on our left and right, and we're enjoying this lovely time in Brazil. I'm like, I gotta take this call. There's a guy in Brazil who needs my help. And she said, yeah, of course, I get it, no problem. So we stopped and I talked to him for 20 minutes and she sat there and she listened to me and she's just like, it's so cool. It's like you're a little horse whisperer to failing entrepreneurs. <laughs> and, you know, recently at Trunk Club I had to, I had to transition slash terminate a very talented employee who just wasn't the right fit anymore and, and had to demote somebody. And I feel like when I go into those conversations now, I can be pretty authentic about saying, hey, I've been in your shoes, I've, I've walked in your shoes. It's gonna suck for a while, here's what you should do. So, like any good New Yorker, I started seeing a therapist. And, uh, and I cast around and I tried to figure out what I was gonna do next and the trunk club thing just kinda happened. And So talk about that, I don't think most people understand the Trunk Club story is an, as an unusual birth. To talk about that for oh, a minute. This is just so, so dicey and so scary to think about what happened. So Trunk Club actually existed already. It was based in Bend, Oregon. We had one full-time employee. It was a founder. She's a 25-year-old, really talented. And uh, they were trying to raise money in Silicon Valley and everybody told them, you're not credible. There's no way we'll give you money. You're 25 and you know, you know nothing about business, but this is a good idea. So go get a technical co-founder, go get someone who can run this business, go get a co-founding CEO and you'll be able to raise money. And one of those venture firms called me and said, hey, we heard you're leaving Bonobos, which we're really shocked about. We were trying to invest in your last round and we think the world of you. And so we wonder if you would consider taking over Trunk Club if we were to put some money in. And so, you know, I went from feeling like, oh my gosh, I'll never find a job again, and I, how do I pay my rent in New York, to like being courted for another opportunity just a few days after I made the announcement that I was leaving. So it was a nice little shot in the arm, you know, and I was, yeah. at, I was at a low point. It's sort of like a rebound, rebound kind of thing, you know, and I was like, all right, well, I'm going to talk to these guys and just get back on my horse. And um, it sounded interesting, and they were really complimentary to me, and they kind of helped me rebuild a little self-esteem at a time where I was, I was really feeling a little bit broken. And so I, um, I flew out to San Francisco, met with them. They flew me to Bend. I met with Joanna, and uh, it's like, this is pretty interesting. And they're like, well, look, we've been working on the deal for four months, and we just haven't been able to find a CEO who's dumb enough to take over this business. <laughs> but you're just dumb enough to do this. And, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to get you while you're at your frail point. And uh, they were right. They got me. They convinced me that it would be a good opportunity. And uh, I said, look, I'll take over as CEO, but I need to, I need to own a big piece of this because it's tiny. And it, it's, I'm basically going to be the founder of this business. We don't have any full-time employees other than How this founder. How much revenue was it at the time? $20,000 a month. Wow. So, yeah, so nothing. It was, yeah. Infancy. Right. We had 15 part-time salespeople who lived in different parts of the world who had paid two to $5,000 for the right to be a stylist at Trunk Club. So it's basically like it's basically somewhere between like Mary Kay and a Ponzi scheme. It's not a Ponzi scheme because we never let any of those people make money for signing up other people. But if they had, we'd probably never have made it out of the, the mess that we got into. So I agreed to become the CEO. Joanna and I became fast friends. Turns out there were some inconsistencies, but I didn't recognize them at the time because I was sort of also a wounded founder and respectful of her position. And uh, became the CEO at the end of November. Three days later, Joanna resigned at the risk of being in really deep trouble for inconsistencies that we discovered. Um, like, like revenue was reported that was really investment capital from people who are not disclosed to us. That, a lot of things that were um, just... A lot of things know, that you would have made you red flag. Yeah, maybe, and just, like, just surprised us. And so when confronted, she resigned immediately. And... Uh, and I had actually hired a guy in Chicago to be our like, part-time ops guy and sent him to Bend, Oregon, to put the company in a semi-truck and move it to Chicago. He was moving the company and all of her belongings from Bend to Chicago, and she resigned. So he was driving on a Sunday, and that Sunday at noon, she had a call with our board and resigned. 
And I had to call him and say, turn the truck around and go park in a Walmart. Like, I'm gonna try to figure out what's going on here. And, uh, you know, just go see a movie, you know, buy yourself a nice dinner, stay in a hotel, it's on me, you know, no big deal. And so um, we dropped her personal effects because we were moving her across the country as well. She had signed a lease on an apartment in Chicago. She was actually quite excited about moving the business to Chicago after I did my dog and pony show about what a great town I thought this was to build Trunk Club in. And uh, we dropped her stuff off in her front yard and because uh, she wouldn't sort of like work with us and blah, blah, blah. And uh, drove what was left of Trunk Club to Chicago and then realized that most of the people that were our part-time salespeople were quite unhappy and disenchanted and um, the floodgates opened and I took a lot of flack and uh, tried to rebuild credibility with them for the next several months, flew them all to Chicago, put them up in hotels, met them, interviewed them, and, uh, and it just didn't work out. So we started from scratch and in April I just said, well, we gotta start selling clothes so I'm gonna start doing it myself. And I sold $10,000 in clothes in April. Our company sold a total of like 39,000. And in May, I sold $35,000 of clothes myself and the company sold just over 70,000. So I basically was just selling myself. And in May, I was like, this is actually, this is a great business. This is gonna work. Um, and we were able to recruit our first sales manager and he is now a, a superstar leader at our company and has helped hire the other 105 salespeople. And lessons on product market fit from the first time you applied the second time that really worked or lessons from the uh, second time? It probably a little bit less compelling. Um, perhaps it would it'd suffice to say we realized we needed to hire a full-time salesperson versus a part-time salesperson. <laughs> if there was something we, disti we, we sort of, a distinction we drew, it was that you needed to be in person with the clothes and full-time to be a really effective stylist at Trunk Club. And so, you know, the original model was, you know, you don't take a lot of inventory and you don't pay these people any base salary and it's like a multi-level marketing company. And that morphed into, if we're gonna be really good at dressing men, we gotta have these stylists come to work every day and live, eat, and breathe what we do. I, you know, there aren't a lot of good innovation-based companies or great ones that aren't passionate about being the best at what they do. I don't think you can kind of dabble and really amaze people. I think that's right, and I think um, I think in the case of these multi-level marketing companies, there's there's a simplicity to their product. Like Sensi is like a, a wickless candle or something, and it's like one of those many super successful multi-level marketing companies based out of Utah. And like that, you know, it's not that sophisticated to describe, and it doesn't change that much over time. Our product's pretty hard to get right, you know. Like, and um, you have to be a good salesperson, and you have to be a really talented stylist, and those things, you know. Those, those don't overlap that often, so we, we wanna meet the people. We now put every single stylist who gets a full-time job with us on trial for a full month before they get a full-time offer. And so they've beaten out, you know, for every one we've hired, they beat out 10 to get that spot. Wow. And so, you know, we're pretty finicky about who we bring onto that team. So before we get to the questions from the crowd, because there are some interesting ones. <laughs> That's those my fault looking for at being them. so loose. Um, uh, talk. Two, two questions. One, scaling. Uh, as you and as you think about scaling, and you, you know, companies get to a certain point, product market fit tar starts to take off. What kind of uh, challenges or stories do you have about insights do you have about scaling? Oh man, I mean, where do we start? There's so many. It's a real privilege to scale a business, and I think it's important to remember that. I think um, I noted in another thing I wrote on LinkedIn about how like each subsequent round you need to get humbler. When you're only like four or five people, you don't have to be that humble. You could literally be like a little bit crazy and a little bit cocky because you have to be that way to convince people to come work with you when you don't have anything. But as you get bigger, I think you need to scale that back and really scale up your listening skills. And um, you know, maybe, maybe one anecdote I could discuss is hiring a COO. So in, uh, in July of 2011, we, we signed a term sheet to raise a large round, $11 million of, of venture funding. And at that time, I met a really talented operator in the Bay Area. And we had never been thinking about hiring a, an expensive, you know, fancy COO. But I met this guy in the process of pitching VC firms. And I was like, this guy's just super talented. His name's Rob Chesney. He now works for us. And uh, after we closed the round, I called him up and I just said, hey, uh, you know, was super impressed by your insight on our business and was wondering if it made sense for us to kind of continue this conversation. Well, this, this is a big coup because Rob, those of you who don't know, Rob ran eBay Motors, ran eBay's U.S. consumer, was an entrepreneur at Greylock with Reed Hoffman and the crew, at, um, an executive in residence there. And you got him to, and I met, I was with Reed that summer when Rob was there and I said, 
Rob is a friend of mine, and he brought it up. He said, we're looking for a company for Rob. We really want to find something. I know Peter Barris was looking. Others, and uh, everybody's shocked when he moved to Chicago for Trunk. Yeah, it was a real coup, and I think, um, without telling the whole story how we got him, I would just say, we didn't really need a COO then. We really need one now. And it's been a huge advantage that he's now got 18, 18 months of experience under his belt and joined when he did. And, um, you know, he's a far more talented operator and leader than I am. And I think some people, you know, it's funny, I was sitting in the locker room with one of my teams, Bull and Bear, uh, a, a year and a half ago when, it, when the announcement was made that, uh, that we hired Rob. And one of the guys said to me in front of the whole team, he's like, well, aren't you nervous now that you've got like this, you know, big time COO and you're going to, you know, that he's going to kind of run the company? And I said, no, I'm thrilled. Like, I recognize how I've already been told and realized I was so bad at this that anything I can do to get help to be better at it is great. You know, we have, we have complementary leadership styles. He's very complimentary of working with you and, and very positive. Yeah, well, complimentary meaning, like, has a lot of skills I don't have? Absolutely, right? No, but I mean, he, he says... He puts up with me. No, but, he, he, he's a big fan of yours, and he, I think he enjoys working with you a lot. He has a lot of respect for you, and, uh, um, you know, I think that's a, a but real I, credit. You know, if there's a... If there's a if t to distill the learning there, maybe it's um, don't be afraid to bring in someone who's a lot better than you and don't be afraid to pay them really well. You know, we, we really stretched on the comp side to get him because we had to. I mean, he, his options were to take over, to be a CEO in the Bay Area where pay scales are different and he'd been super successful. And um, it didn't really like occur to me how, how it all worked, but we ended up stretching and we, we, we came up with a deal and it felt like we probably were paying him a little too much. and. You know, a few months later, I got I got wind that a recruiter was all over him for a pretty big time COO job at a company here in Chicago where they were offering him like a seven figure salary, and uh, I I remember thinking I'm glad we gave him as much as we gave him because I think he felt like he was treated fairly, and as a result, he's not trying to leave. That's a really that's a really great. Point. And it was a sweet moment because I had this epiphany, and you know, I, I've always preached that you should. Um, pay people more than perhaps you think you can and, and really stretch on the comp side. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people on our, in our world are shocked. At, we have more stylists on our team out of 110 that will make over $100,000 this year than Nordstrom has salespeople who will make over $100,000 this year, at least based on what's publicly available and been disclosed. So... I, I'm really proud of that, That's and I'm really proud of how well we take care of our people. And I think, you know, I think that lesson is just like you can't be cheap. You know, you can't you can't go hire free interns to do stuff for you and expect greatness. That's great. It works in some businesses. ShiftGig has an awesome intern program, but it's the perfect business for interns given the feet on the street nature of it. And then what they do is when they're good, they immediately convert them to paying them hourly. We do the same thing, right? When someone's good on pick, pack, and ship, we give them salary benefits. You know, we, we immediately recognize talent and get them out How of that paradigm. How many people do you have now? A little over 200. Wow. That's amazing. Well, yeah. I have to get to the questions because everybody's voting for the one. Uh, candidly... What do you think of Pat Ryan's outfit? <laughs> I like it. Thank you. I like it a lot. So one of the things that Pat does well is he has an easy style. And I think, you know, a lot of guys who are in their late 30s, um, like Pat is. Exactly. And who are married, they kind of, what they get wrong is like they're either trying too hard or they're not trying enough. And so I think the easy rapport he strikes when he's talking to people and the sort of the, that it all works well is awesome. If I could change one thing, I'd ask him to tuck in his shirt. Because I think if you're over 30, you should tuck in your shirt. There you go. It's also summer and it's hot outside. And I'm, I'm and fine I'm with that. And I'm hiding my mic. Yeah, exactly. But uh, no, you're, it's, it's interesting. So my wife Good did, question. My wife did not dress me, I have to say in fairness to her. But uh, the nice thing about working in tech is that if I dress in a suit, the engineers all think we either got sued or I'm selling the company. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and and one of my favorite people at Trunk Club, whenever he wears a suit, he sits down next to me and he goes, ah, "Job interview, nailed it." <laughs> <laughs> it's a good move. It's really funny. It gets me every time. Um, so we have the great thing is we have top voting. You guys have voted tonight really well. Thank you. It's it's really helpful. So it seems like you raise venture uh, effortlessly. How do you do it? Well, so I actually wrote a post about this and. Um, and I think it's good five steps you can follow um, to, to recap. Can you give people your blog so they can read this? Well, I, it's a, I just, I'm a LinkedIn influencer, 
which sounds like a drug dealer, but it's actually, it's like a, it's true. Um, and so if anyone follows me on LinkedIn, you'll see what I write about entrepreneurship. I think, I think the mistake people often make is that they think that raising capital is a milestone and like a, and like a, a, a goal. It really should just be sort of like uh, something that happens along the way. And so, for example, if you're not finding that it's pretty easy to raise venture capital, you're probably not building a business that deserves to raise venture capital. It doesn't mean that you can't um, that you can't pivot, or perhaps you know some businesses just shouldn't be venture backed. But I think the market, you know, venture capitalists are pretty generous with their time, and they're willing to spend time with interesting companies. And one of the things I say in my post is, ask for high quality venture introductions via your board members or your influential early investors or your influential employees. If you don't have any of those things to tee up venture conversations, you probably aren't even at that step where you're ready to do that yet. And Venture, venture firms are so interesting. They're, it's really a lot like dating, and you know, here's where I get off the rails. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, you, you want to be that girl that everyone wants to take to the dance. You don't want to be desperate. You need to raise money before you really need it. And if you can't, you're probably not showing enough traction to really have the business. You know, in some ways, the venture community's response to your and treats to raise capital will be a litmus test for what you've built and the quality of that. Um, I, would, I would suggest that you know, Eddie Liu is a, great, is a great fundraiser, and one of the things that he does very well is he just communicates, and he's active, and he's networked, and he's confident. And I think that all those qualities are probably um, some of the most important ones. You know, a, a, high, a high priced round is usually not a great thing because it means you gotta live up to those expectations very quickly, or you're in trouble. And if you're me, you lose your job, and uh, if you don't hit those milestones. And I think that um, if there's a mistake I see entrepreneurs make, it's that their, their expectations are too high, right? Let, let's walk through the math here, Pat. If you raise, let's say you raise $500,000 at a million and a half dollar valuation, and so you, give, you sell a quarter of your company, um, you still own 75% as a management team of something. If you are trying to raise money at a $4 million valuation and the market is just saying it's not happening, you own 100% of something that has no money, right? And so you know, I always just ask myself, would I rather be generous with my investors who are going to have a great influence on what else I get to do with my career and with our company, or would I rather be greedy as a founder and as a person who more or less speaks for the management team that owns a, a, a portion of the equity? And so. I, if, if there's a, if there, I think it's about being modest and being reasonable about your expectations, being humble. If you have a bunch of people that all want to give you money, yeah, you can probably you can probably choose a price that's a little higher. Ever, Elon must say the biggest mistake he made when he was raising money and he was doing things earlier was he raised money. Uh, he was focused on valuation rather than value added the investor, and the valuation didn't mean anything. In some ways, could backfire on you, and, and uh, it's great great advice. How are you leveraging technology to differentiate Trunk Club from other retailers? Oh man, uh, in, in almost every way we can, but the, I would say this, uh, the, the paradigm that we operate under is that everything is personalized. And the paradigm that other retailers operate under is everything is self-service. So the mistake that J.Crew and Nordstrom are making right now is they're trying to approach Apple level in-store experience where like, Everyone's hip and wearing the same colored T-shirt and can check you out really quickly. Like that solves a problem they have, which is the shopping experience isn't that great, but it doesn't prevent you from having to go to their store <coughs> and still do all that stuff yourself. The problem we're solving is you don't want to shop, so we're gonna make it super easy. We're gonna show you on your iPhone the four new versions of the shirt you told us you loved, and then we're gonna send you three other things with that, and we have a right to send you stuff you haven't asked for which is special about what we do. So we're using technology to personalize every aspect of this interaction and to empower our stylists, make them bionic. And our, we don't believe that our competitors have hired the right people to do that. And we don't believe that they've spent their technology funds, their development resources on personalization Instead, they've just worked on optimizing self-serve. See, it's still going to a big store 
and find stuff that you like, yeah, sure, maybe you have a better checkout experience. Maybe they have a handheld, maybe they have a PDA in their hand, but they don't know really what to do with that. We pride ourselves on our, our developers having a lot of interactions with our, our, our best and experienced stylists and having them just talk one-to-one. -one. What do you need me to build? I don't believe that bridge is built in a lot of our competitors. I think that they sit in a room and they think, what can we build that feels like, you know, they, they go to conferences and look for inspiration. It's like, we, we just sit with our customers and derive inspiration naturally. It's like, it's like farm to table which is the most overused term in the, when is, when is a restaurant meal not farm to table? How does it ever not eventually go from your, a farm to a table? I don't understand that. Sorry, this is, a, this, is a, this is something I've been trying, this is a riddle, I think, because as far as I know, all food starts on a farm and ends up on a table. It's a, it's a, great, it's a great point. It's a great point on, on knowing your customer. Let me take another question here. So people have talked about you investing in companies as an angel investor. What do you look for? in companies you invest in, and what companies have you invested in recently, and why? So, um, Which is typically my last question, um, and I'll make it my second to last question here, is, so talk about what you look to invest in, but also companies you're excited about in Chicago. Yeah, so um, super pumped about Shift Gig. We talked about that. Uh, what I looked for and what I, what I really admire, um, Sean Casey and Jeff Baetta and Eddie Liu are co-founders. They get along really well. One of the hardest things to do when you have a cool idea is actually make it come to fruition on the technology side. And Sean Casey is a brilliant CTO. And Sean and Jeff's previous business is like an IT services business. So they came into this with like 20 full-time technology employees and developers. And Sean is just brilliant. So you, you, you right there, you've taken one of the big risks off the table, right? Dev team, hire the right tech people, and have the, um, have the mind meld with the founders and the technology team. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That was, for me, that was a huge, hugely attractive thing. And then, you know, we talked about product market fit a lot tonight. So I think about that. And sometimes I also just think about like, how hungry are these people? Like, do they need this to win? One of my favorite investments in town is, um, I'm an investor in Spotlight and Perkspot. It's a company run by Chris Hill. It's doing phenomenal things in the sort of, um, employee perks and insurance space. They're finding ways, this is like Starbucks as a client, and they have enabled all of Starbucks's employees to have an easy portal where they can buy these sort of ancillary benefits, things like supplemental life insurance, health insurance. Like, so solving that problem of hourly employees need to be treated like real employees and th need to be extended these opportunities such as ancillary benefits, supplemental benefits, is a really interesting one. And it's really tricky because ins the insurance industry is like a classic, you know, like where C students make $400,000 a year. If that isn't an indication that it's ripe for innovation, I don't know what is. And they're going after that and building really cool tech solutions. So what I like about Chris is like he's got three kids, a wife who doesn't work. He's been working on this business for six years. He's super authentic. He, he sells the product. He's a great entrepreneur. And he's got to make it work, right? So that's one of my largest investments. I just I believe it's a really c captivating space. So I look at the market a little bit. I don't worry about competition. I worry about execution. I, I look for entrepreneurs I want to spend time with because at the end of the day, I feel like an inv a venture investment is just a $25,000, which is like a typical sort of minimum investment. And I don't often have enough to do that, but maybe because of my experience, they'll let me in for 10 or 15 or something. Um, it's basically like you're buying courtside seats because then you get, you get like this quarterly update or a monthly update and you're, you're part of the team. That's really fun. So that's why I do it. I, don't, I know I'm not going to be that good at it. I think if I break even and then have all these wonderful events I get to attend, like, you know, the, like I said, the well, courtside seats. Well, these companies, are, it, it helps a lot to have your experience, which I think is great that you give the time as busy as you are. To, last question I, I always like to ask, and you have a unique perspective on this. Um, you know, Chicago, we certainly are uh, uh, a lot of excitement. You can see from the crowd here, people standing in back, uh, a lot of great things going on here. I think the question is, you've been in San Francisco, you've been in Palo Alto, um, You've had a startup in New York. You've now done startups on both coasts. You came here. What are your thoughts on the challenges and maybe end with the uh, opportunities for Chicago or strengths for Chicago? So um, I don't know if we, if we lost filming. I'll repeat the question just because I'm sensitive and appreciative of the AV techs because they're awesome and they've done a great job tonight. Thank you. Um, so the question is, like, you know, Chicago, as a startup, as an entrepreneur, how does it rank? How does it compare? How does it contrast to things like uh, other cities I've lived in, New York and, and Silicon Valley, San Francisco? 
So I think this is still a golden opportunity. I kind of think it's like late 1948 and we're on our way west. Like we're like the Donner Party, but we don't have to eat each other. Um, we're, we're in this amazing stretch where there's still just so much talent that wants to work at a startup that's trapped in a corporation with like commute to the suburbs, which is just like this soul sucking dark existence that people wanna, <laughs> wanna like release themselves from. And you know, I'm like, the rents are still reasonable. The talent is still prevalent. I think the Big Ten schools are prescient enough to know they're gonna need to start cranking out a lot more engineer. I think the writing's on the wall if you're a somewhat enterprising 18 to 22 year old, because the democratization of information is so good right now via Google. Thank you, Eric Schmidt. That's like his thing in life is democratize information. And I really, I've always really admired him for that. Um, I think this is a sweet place to be. I think people will look back, maybe it's not a gold rush that's got negative connotations, but you know, our our goal at Trunk Club as a as a as a board, as my angel investors who are mostly local, and my team, and I tell them this once a month in our all hands meeting, is to look back and to be one small part of this nascent movement here and to have you know, we want a trunk club mafia. We have never had a Chicago company mafia. Right? And what does that mean? It means you, you, you have a lot of people who make over a million dollars when you have your exit. Those people become advisors, friends, mentors, leaders. And by the way, there's some, there's some sweet businesses that are teed up to do this. I think Braintree and Grubhub are the two that, you know, go health. I mean, they, these guys are doing it. But Centro, we, we Savo. Centro, yeah, awesome. Love Sean. Like, those, they're all our great customers. They're super supportive. Matt Maloney at Grubhub, I think, is brilliant. But those guys... Matt Matros, Protein Bar, another business I've invested in and absolutely love. It's so cool. It's so easy to understand. It's so easy to taste. It's delicious. It's really good. Uh, those, we need 100 of those. And that's what 1871 is so inspiring. To, that's why I'm so inspired by this, is we, have, we now have a place where those people, we, it's like, come here. Exercise these muscles, you know, bump, you know, brush, brush elbows with these people. Get exposed to the Stuart Larkins and the Pat Ryan's and the Kevin Willers of the world who've done this. But there aren't enough of us, right? We won't, we won't have success until 15, 20 years from now when half the people in this audience are doing this. And so, I think what's inspiring about that is it's still early, and I've always thought it would be more fun to be part of this community in Chicago than part of one more story in the Bay Area or New York. So to tie it back to your question, why am I here? Well, one, I see opportunity in talent arbitrage. Two, I see, I see meaning. And I'd like to think I'm getting closer to operating in the top part of that Maslow's pyramid, which is like transformation and, 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 and um, how you spend your life changing the way people think and, and act. And you know, what I'm most proud of at Trunk Club is that we have 200 people that love coming to work every day in River North and that we can be supportive of 25 Degrees and Municipal and Uchoy and the other restaurants we eat at and that we, and that we have great, a great relationship with Underground, right? They throw parties for us, we throw parties for them. We support them when they open new restaurants. They give us discounts at lunch, Union Sushi, right? We are like a third of their business and they treat us so well. It's just fun to be part of that. Yeah. And I think that there's uh, like an anonymity and sort of like a, a rat race aspect to the 101 and the 280 in the Bay Area that like that doesn't have this charm aspect of what we do, and I think that that's I think that's a I think it's a really special time to be here, and so I'm I'm honored to be part of this. Um, I'm grateful that you guys invited me to be, to to talk tonight, and I'm hopeful that um, many of you will go out and be part of this um, this next wave. It's it's super cool to be here, and it's really exciting what you guys are doing in this space. Thank you. You've been a great entrepreneur. It's been a great evening. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks.